Lord, we come to you, and we thank you for this day. We thank you for your grace, your goodness. We thank you for your word. We pray that even now you would teach us and bring us understanding of your word, and that you would apply it to our hearts and lives, and that, Lord, we could bring you glory and honor because you so richly deserve it. So we ask that you would just instruct us now, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I started reflecting on Thanksgiving and just the heart of being thankful to God. And one of the things that I went over in my thoughts was, you know, here in this country, I mean, we really do have a lot to be thankful for. We have, I know there's a lot of problems and I know the political system and all the troubles, but I still get to eat every day. And, and, and I have clothes to wear. And I can actually even stay warm. And, and I'm thankful for the things that I do have and that God's blessed me with. But in thinking of that, I thought, you know, there's also, we are in a world and there's trials and in this life we'll go through tribulation. And some of us are going through much tribulation and others have gone through tribulations, and probably in the future, many of you will continue to have trials. So I know that there are seasons where it's hard to find something to be thankful for because of the difficulties that we face, the troubles, the trials, the attacks. But when I was looking at some of the passages I thought, not only are we thankful for the things that we've been blessed with, but I am very thankful for the things that God has taken away, namely my sin. That he has truly taken all my sin away from me and paid the price for it. And, and if I'm struggling and having a hard time in life, I can always look back and say, thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Thank you for doing that. There, there is something I can look back, and I know it's hard during a trial and, a, and, a, and you know, an attack. It, it's hard to find something to be thankful for, but I really need to focus on the fact of having that, that heart of gratitude for what Jesus has already done for me. He, he, He's already accomplished it. He paid the price for me. He, he died for my sins. And how important it is to reflect on that at times. Thank you, Lord. That, that, not that this necessarily is a prayer, but I, but I hope it will be something I embrace, that if the Lord did not another thing for me in helping me through this life, I've already been given more than I deserve. Much, much more. Because I know what I deserve. I deserve hell and damnation. I deserve to be eternally separated from God. My sin did that. And yet, his incredible love redeemed me and, and saved me and atoned, his blood atoned for my sin, paid the full price for my sin. And so to embrace that, is, I believe, very powerful. So in thinking of this, in, in Thanksgiving time had come in, I was reminded of some scriptures and some, some passages that I wanted to touch on today. And the first one's found here in Luke 17. In Luke 17, we see as Jesus is passing through the midst of Samaria and the Galilee area, as he and his disciples are going through the area and passing through and, and people are flocking to him and coming to him looking for a healing and, and listening to his teaching, there was this group of lepers which had a disease that made them an outcast of society that caused them to be removed from the culture at hand and, and pushed off to the outskirts, and they were looked down upon, and, and some people thought they're in a state that they're in because of their own fault and sin, 
and others just didn't want anything to do with them because they thought that just, just associating them with them could make them unclean. And then especially the religious people believed and thought, and, and there was some reason that just touching them or allowing them to touch you could contaminate you and make you unclean spiritually and physically. And so they would best just push them off of society, stay away from us to where the leper was forced to declare himself unclean. And, and I see for the prevention of the disease, but would have to walk around and declare themselves unclean, unclean. And people would push them aside and, and be very cruel to them. Well, as Jesus is traveling through, there's these 10 lepers that have one thing in common, and that's their illness, their disease. In fact, as you read the text, it's, it, it, it looks like that there were nine Jewish lepers and one Samaritan leopard, and they grouped together and they cried out to Jesus as he was passing by. Now, this was a, a hard task to do individually because a lot of leprosy would affect the, the vocal cords and the throat and, and the ability to speak in, in any great way. It would be more like a whisper if they could manage to do that. And so, with a multitude that was traveling with Jesus, they had a common need and you saw them come together because it says they cried out basically with one voice. They realized that they needed the many cries to be heard. And so they grouped together and they together cried out for the help from Jesus. And Jesus heard them. And he stopped. And he ministered to them. Well, the story continues, but why don't we jump into the beginning of it here in chapter 17, in verse 11. It says, And it came to pass, as he went to Jerusalem, that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. And he entered into a certain village, and there met him ten men that were leopards, which stood afar off. They had to, because of their disease and and you know really if you look at that disease and understand it as sin it usually does keep people at a distance not only from the lord but i found that a life that continues in sin will cause an individual to distance themselves especially from the body of christ it will keep them apart. They, they don't want to associate and get too close. And, and usually it's because they don't want their sin to be exposed. But sin usually separates. It, it, it causes a distance to be there. But, but though there was this physical distance, it didn't stop them from crying out to the Lord, nor did it stop the Lord from hearing their cry, that, that here the Lord heard them and responded to them. And, and yet the sin was there because of Christ. It had no power to, to separate them from the Lord because he was going to restore and to heal and, and, it, and it really unfolds this way as you read it. It says, so they were afar off and they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Have mercy on us. Lord, may your mercy, meaning I deserve what I have, but please don't allow the, the, the punishment to, to be accounted on my behalf. Don't, don't allow it to be transferred to me. It, it, it's mercy. Don't give me what I deserve. 
And so there was a cry, have mercy. It, it also obviously had the understanding of bring healing to me, to heal me, Lord. To, to, to notice me in the state that I am and deliver me. To, to see me where I'm at. Now that was a very first step. It was a good step to be able to come to the Lord and, and acknowledge the sin that was there or the state that they were in. I'm in a bad state, Lord. Have mercy on me. I, I, I'm in a bad way. Have mercy. And that's really the first step of coming to God is, Lord, I'm a sinner. Save my soul. I need you as my Savior. I, I'm in a bad state. I, I can't fix myself. I can't change my life. I, I, I can't do anything to correct the path that I'm on. I need you, Lord. And that's a wonderful cry from the heart. Have mercy on me, Lord. And they together cried out to the Lord, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said to them, go show yourselves unto the priest. He, he was speaking of what's found in the Levitical law. You will see it in chapter 14 of Leviticus. I, I encourage you to read like verses 1 through 3 there. And you'll see that those that were, had leprosy were required to go to the priest and be examined. And there was a whole lengthy process of what would take place in the examination. And so Jesus was not coming against the law. He said, go show yourself to the priest. And so we see that it came to pass that as they went, they were cleansed. That, that as they walked in the obedience that, that of the command of the Lord, that that cleansing happened. So it didn't happen right at first. It, it didn't take place right before their eyes. It was a process that while they were walking in obedience, the cleansing was taking place. The healing was happening. And there are a lot of times I cry out to the Lord, Lord, save me, have mercy on me. And he encouraged me, go live for me, go walk, go do what I've called you to do. And, and I want that immediate healing, but yet there's times that he wants me to walk in the obedience of his word and see the process take place, the healing come, the transformation, if you would. Or for me, being saved, the sanctification, that continual process of him taking away the corruption of my flesh and bringing me into the newness of his life. And, but yet I have to walk in obedience. I, I need to listen to his voice and walk according to his word. So here these men heard it, and probably they wanted to hear something else. If you think of it, there are many times that he would say, rise up and walk. Your faith has made thee whole. I mean, I would rather hear that than go your way to the priest. You know, I mean, I'm like, Wait, wait a minute, okay, you're probably talking to someone else. Where's the rise up and walk, be ye cleaned? I don't even care if you spit in the mud and make dirt and put it on me. Just where's the cleansing right now? And he didn't say that to them. And he said, go show yourself to the priest. Basically, go in the faith of my word and let your life be examined by others. Let it be seen. Go, go in the faith of my word. And so I would need to say, okay, Lord, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to journey with you under your authority, knowing that you're going to do the transforming work. Now, I could have sat there and pouted. He didn't say, rise up and walk. Or he didn't say, be clean. Or I could have decided, I'm going to walk according to his word and allow the transformation to take place and the witness of his touch upon my life to be seen. So as they went their way, now that must have been to me, I mean, a miraculous thing. I mean, here, you know, I have leprosy. Who knows the stage that they were in? I mean, you could have rotting flesh, body, body parts falling off. You, 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 you would have all kinds of, you know, situations and you're walking probably in great agony and as you're moving, all of a sudden, who knows, all of a sudden in the moment or within a space of time, 
you're healed. <laughs> you're like, whoa, look at this. He did it. And it declares that they were healed as they left. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back and with a loud voice glorified God. Now that's, that's crucial. That's, that's a, a noted point. He didn't have a loud voice prior. His voice was subdued and all of them had to cry out to God to be heard. But now, because he was transformed, he shouted with a loud voice. You know, instead of, Jesus, have mercy on us. Lord, thank you! Oh, I can get louder. You want to, no, we won't go there. <laughs> and, and here, with that loud voice, he, he just glorified God. Lord, thank you! And he was the one, he turned back. And it says, and fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks, and he was a Samaritan. I think that's crucial. You see, the Jews didn't really associate with the Samaritans. They looked at them as inferior half-breeds, they, they didn't like them. They didn't believe in their doctrine. They didn't worship the way they did. They worshiped up in the mountains and here, you know, the Jews in the temple. And they, they were just kind of outcast to the Jews. They were considered dogs and, and lower class citizens. And I think the point here is that the one was a Samaritan, which infers that the others were probably Jews. But the one that was the Samaritan knew that I didn't deserve what just happened to me. I didn't deserve it. And I am so grateful for a changed life, for a cleansed life. I am so grateful that he came back and he worshiped him. And Jesus answered and said, Were there not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? And he said, there are not found uh, that he turned to give glory to God, save this stranger. It was the stranger that gave glory. And, and I pondered that, and I thought, well, where were the nine? There were ten men, all had the same disease, all have given the, were given the same command, all of them left and, and walked to, to go present themselves to the priests. All of them were cleansed on the journey, but one came back. And I thought that one was the one that realized I didn't deserve the grace of God. And I thought about the others being Jews and the, the culture of the time and seeing the, the way they acted toward Jesus I almost came up with a thought of, or he did come up with a thought, but almost thought that maybe the other nine just thought, well, I'm a Jew. It should have happened to me. Kind of like they deserve the healing. And I thought, how many of there that are in our culture that are ungrateful because they believe they deserve certain things? I, I deserve that. I should be treated that way. I should have this and that. And it causes a lack of gratitude in their heart. Uh, a generation that believes that they deserve everything is a generation that is unthankful. And here this man being a Samaritan was conditioned that he deserved nothing, especially from a Jewish prophet I mean, the Jews had no dealings with them. He, a Jewish Messiah? But yet, because of that, his heart was humble and he came back with, with a wonderful 
heart of thankfulness and gratitude. And I thought, Lord, help me not to live this life feeling this world or you owe me something. But help me to live this life with a grateful heart of what you have done already for me. What you have already accomplished. What you have already done. And may that be enough to give you praise for. To fall on my face and worship you for who you are. You, you had mercy on me. The very prayer was answered, have mercy on us. And he came back and said, I can't believe you had mercy on me. Thank you. Thank you for having mercy on me. And, and it can erase a lot of all the how come this and why that and how come my life isn't the same as this person's. Lord, I deserved absolutely nothing. And yet in your abundant mercy, you forgave me of my sin and saved my soul. Thank you, Lord. And there was such a, a gratitude. And, and it's hard when you're, you know, feeling the pressure of life and you're attacked and there's a trial and a situation and, and it's relentless. The, the enemy is frustrating you on every turn. And there are times I just need to shut the world out and sit before my king and say, thank you. You had mercy on me. I may never find that in this world, but I found it with you. Thank you, Lord. And this Samaritan came and he worshiped Jesus. And he said unto him, Arise, go thy way. Thy faith made thee whole. This one though the same mercy was given to all of them, this one did exactly what the Lord said because he did go to his priest to be examined. He went to the high priest, Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ examined him and said, you are whole. This man got it. This man accepted Jesus as his high priest and was made whole and was, was examined and cleansed and thy faith has made thee whole. Jesus did not acknowledge that about the other men. He said they were cleansed. But how many people experience and get touched by the, the presence and the miracles of God, but their unthankful heart or unreceptive heart never makes them whole. I, I've seen people cry out to God and, and, and I've prayed for a miracle and a miracle's happened in their life and months later they are so far from God without any acknowledgement that he's their savior. But this one, this one received was grateful, went to his high priest, was examined, and the testimony and the verdict was out. Your faith has made you whole. Now go your way. And he went his way. What, what I love is little things like the knowledge of God. You know, he knows everything. Even Jesus, though he surrendered that, that portion of, of himself, when he walked in, in human form and he then was returned to the glory he once had. But he knew that they were all made whole along the way. He didn't see it. He declared it and knew it. Because when the one came back, he said, weren't ten made whole on your journey? He, he knows everything. He sees everything. He's with you everywhere you go. And I believe that, that the very presence of God was upon them as they were traveling as the work of the Spirit did the miraculous work in their life. But the one turned back, and it was from that grateful heart. There's another passage that I mentioned in Luke 7 that I'd like to look at.
Look at verse 36. In verse 36 of Luke chapter 7, it says, And one of the Pharisees desired him that he would eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house, and he sat down to meet, to have a meal. And behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at the house uh, to, to eat, or at meat, in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment. Now, when Jesus was entered into the house, they kind of sat in a reclining fashion. And as they would recline and lean on their side, they would curl their feet and their feet would be behind them as they would kind of lean forward and eat and enjoy the fellowship with the people that were there. Now, I do not believe this Pharisee had invited the woman that was going to come. But proper etiquette did allow for strangers to come in, especially if there was an important guest. If there was an important guest to dinner, the door was open and they could come in. They were not invited to sit and participate in the meal, but they could be observers so that they could see and hear and maybe be taught something from the guests that was at the house. So they could observe this this dinner engagement. And so as Jesus was reclining and his feet tucked behind him, this woman came in who the Bible says was a sinner. It, 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 It accented that because it showed her condition, and how she was viewed and who she was. She was a notorious sinner. She was known to be a sinner within the community. And it goes on and it says, And stood at his feet behind him weeping, and began to wash his feet with tears, and did wipe them with the hairs of her head, and kissed his feet and anointed them, with the ointment she received him with a heart of of gratitude a heart that that just showed her her love for the compassion that that he protruder gave her we don't know if they interacted prior but but nevertheless she was demonstrating her her brokenness and her love for Jesus. I mean, it was so intense that, that the head and the hair is a covering for the Jewish women. It, it was not something to be used as a, a common rag, but for her to, to take that which was precious to her, her hair, And to let it down and use it to wipe Jesus' feet was a a sign of great humility and worthlessness where, where she was just surrendered with great love and affection for him. I mean, I... I can't even see in our culture ladies with long hair and say, well, yeah, I know you spilled milk here. You know, mop it up. There you go. Is that better? All right, puts it back in a bun, you know. There. There would be no way I could ever take my wife's hair and wipe the table if I spilled something. Never. There would be this eye blackened. If I still had an eye. (laughs) I wouldn't have a loud voice either. (laughs) It was was such a sign of her humbling herself and, and realizing I have no worth. He has it all. He deserves all the glory. He alone is worthy and she came in that state of humility 
and, and her tears fell upon his feet and she wiped them. And she took probably uh, her dowry, her, her most prized possession, a very expensive box of ointment, probably one day hoping maybe it was a, a gift from her parents and thinking one day, but her life didn't quite turn out that way that she thought it might because she was a, a sinner. And maybe her path took a different direction and she's like, I, I can't believe it. I made a mess of my life. I, I was to, to save myself to marry Prince Charming, you know. And, and this is the road my life took. And she just felt so broken by it. But yet she took this that might have been her dowry and and poured it about uh, upon her her new husband if you would jesus christ as we are his bride and she she gifted it to him my life is yours lord forgive me my life is yours i love you that the act that she did was one of of great love in her tears falling, in the wiping, in the anointing, in the kissing, it, it was truly an act of love. And she surrendered, you will always be my husband, Lord. You will be the one. And so this was going on, and when the Pharisees which had bidden him saw it, he spake with him, the Pharisees saw it, he spake within himself, so Simon, who called him there, was speaking within himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that touches him, for she is a sinner. And now you get a glimpse of his attitude. Why did he invite Jesus there to begin with? Obviously, it was out of respect and adoration. It, it might have been for who knows what, like many of them did for entrapment, or maybe it was just the thing to do. You know, you got this, this well-known you know, teacher, this well-known rabbi traveling through, and I want to make it look good for the people, and I'm going to invite them. I don't know. But yet, you could tell already his heart that he didn't esteem or didn't value Jesus in any high regard. If he were a prophet, he wouldn't even let this woman. I don't even think he is a prophet. He didn't know this woman. He didn't even sense anything. He didn't discern anything. He, I'm a better prophet than he is. My, my position spiritually and socially is far superior than him. I, could, I discerned it a mile away what kind of woman this was, and he didn't even discern it. And there was that attitude of self and not an attitude of surrender or submission or worthlessness. And so because he saw himself at the very least on par with Jesus, there was no surrendering to him. How sad when mankind believes themselves to be on par with Christ or that they are superior to God, that they are their own God. But whatever the case, you could hear his heart in this expression. And Jesus answered, saying unto him, Simon, I have something to say unto thee. You can't get away with anything. He read his mind and knew what he was thinking, you know. I, I, I can't get, you know, it's not like, okay, God's not, you know, I'm fooling God in what I say. Well, Lord, it really wasn't my fault. And he goes, Kirk, yes, God, remember who you're talking to. Okay, it was my fault. It was my fault. You know, you're not going to fool God. You just confess to him. That's the better state to be in. 
So he said, I have something to say unto thee. And he said, Master, say on. Now, now what a term, Master, say on, when his thought was, what kind of prophet is he? But yet it was an external expression. It, it, was, it was for the crowd and not for him personally. And there was a certain creditor, Jesus says, which had two debtors. The one owed 500 pence and the other 50. When they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him most? And Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to whom forgave us most. And he said unto him, Thou hast rightly judged. That's exactly right. And, and, and I can't help but think the, the parable, if you would, or the analogy of two debtors and one that could forgive was a direct correlation to Simon and the woman. They were the two debtors. And Simon being a Pharisee, well, I don't have much to be forgiven of. I'm a pretty good guy, loved in the market street, invited to all the social parties. I get the best seats at the opera. And this woman here, I wouldn't even associate with her. There were two debtors sitting at that table. One old little and one old much. Which one, Simon, out of your own mouth is going to love them? Both need forgiveness. Both have nothing to repay. But which one? The one that was forgiven the most. That one. You have rightly said, Simon, and he turned to the woman and said unto Simon, Seest thou this woman? I entered into thy house, and thou gave me no water for my feet. But she has washed my feet with her tears, and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Thou gavest me no kiss. But this woman, since the time I came in, has not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil thou did not anoint. But this woman has anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins which are many are forgiven. For she loveth much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. You see, if I come to a state and think I'm better than others, I don't need as much as God's grace as others or forgiveness then it's going to be reflected in my love. It will be limited. But if I can come with a heart of gratitude, Lord, I don't deserve a thing, and yet you save me. Lord, it, it doesn't matter what I have on this earth. What matters is you have forgiven me. And I reflect like it says to those in the church of Ephesus in Revelation chapter 2, it says, you have left your first love. Remember from whence thou has fallen and repent and do the first works. Lord, I, I, I remember from whence I've fallen. You forgave me a lot. And you know what else, Lord? Since I've been saved... You continue to allow that forgiveness to be mine. I've done more since I've been saved now than I've done prior. I mean, I was like, you know, in my te late teens or, you know, just turning 20. And now I'm a little older than that. Little. I mean, I've done more probably now than then in physical things. I mean, I had my sin that needed to be atoned for. I was conceived in that but yet he still forgave me and forgives me and intercedes and tells me that nothing, Kirk, will separate you from my love. People, I got a lot to be grateful for. I've got a lot. And here to reflect on that instead of what I don't have, I sure can reflect on what I do have in his forgiveness. And what I even don't have in my sin 
being accounted toward me. I don't have that because he forgave me. He died for me and he shed his blood for me. To whom much is forgiven, much loveth. And I want to remember, Lord, thank you for all you've forgiven me. Oh, it's easy to think about how others are and how others treat you and what others have done. And that kind of takes away who I am. And I almost kind of like, I, I, I kind of bump myself above them. Well, I wouldn't do that. Not me. And then how quickly something else comes up and I blow it, you know, an attitude, a thought, and I'm like, Lord, even in that thought I blew it, you know, and I'm like, Lord, forgive me. I want to approach you in the, in the humility of who I am compared to who you are. I am not worthy and you alone are worthy. So he said that she has done all this and I and he said unto her thy sins are forgiven you see he already was going to forgive her sin and because of that he's not defiled by her touch remember they said if he knew what kind of sinner she was he wouldn't allow her to touch him the thought was that he would be defiled because he touched something unclean well in Jesus's eyes she was cleansed and could touch him and you if you accepted Christ are cleansed and can touch him and embrace him and they that sat at meat with him began to say within themselves who is this that forgiveth sins also and he said unto the woman thy faith save thee go in peace and I want to encourage you this Thanksgiving I, I have a lot, you know, I, I got to tell you, I, this, this Thanksgiving, without God doing any intervention, I already know I'm going to eat turkey, and I'm going to have gravy, and I make my mom's stuffing, and I love it, and, and, and I indulge myself a little probably more than I should at times. Do you know there's going to be pies there too? <laughs> Did you know that? And I might have to sample them. I mean, my wife makes them and I would hurt her feelings if I didn't. <laughs> but you know, after reading this, what I'm really grateful for, my Savior accepted me, forgave me, cleansed me from my sin wrote my name in his book of life and promised I'll never leave you Kirk and I'll never forsake you so I can tell you above everything else I've got something to be thankful for and you do too so take some time this week and sit with your Savior and indulge yourself in a true Thanksgiving feast when you share with him your gratitude and love and he shares back his to you. Lord, thank you for this time. Thank you for your word. Thank you for allowing us to come together and look in your word and pray that you would move us forward with this thankful heart. We love you, we praise you, and we surrender our lives into your hands and give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Would the worship team come up? Let's stand, please.
That's a Thanksgiving song, Stir Up a Hunger. I think that was just kind of, huh. just, just focus it, not here, but up to here, okay? Kind of move it into that direction and let it be stirred in your heart. I want you to know how much the Lord loves you, he's with you. He's never going to bail out on you. Spend some time and let him know how grateful you are because truly he has done so much. If you need prayer, come forward. We'll pray. Otherwise, have a beautiful week in the Lord. Happy Thanksgiving, everybody, and thanks for coming. God bless you.